Welcome to Playwright to Playwright, an online interview series presented by Queen's Theatre. You are listening to the audio description pre-show notes for the interview. Because the format is fairly simple and the talking is continuous, there will be no audio description during the interview itself. The video begins with a title screen. The Queen's Theatre logo fills up the left side of the screen. The logo resembles the letter Q. The circle of the letter Q is orange and the rectangular tail is black. The text of the title screen reads, Playwright to Playwright with Rob Urbanati and special guest Kui Gwen, originally recorded October 6th, 2020. Technical production, J. Rogers. The Queen's Theatre at Home text logo is in the lower right corner of the frame throughout the interview. The word Queen's is in orange and the word theatre is in black. The interview consists of close-ups of Kui and Rob in large squares filling a split screen with Rob on the left and Kui on the right. At times, when Kui is speaking, a close-up of him fills the screen. Rob is in his 60s with close-cropped dark hair and a round face. He's wearing a black shirt with the Queen's Theatre text logo on it. Rob is in his living room. Kui has a round face and is wearing glasses with black rectangular frames at the top. His dark baseball cap covers his hair almost entirely, and he's using white earbuds. Kui's wearing a blue t-shirt with the Star Wars logo in white letters. Kui is in a white room with a few doors in the background and a framed picture on the wall behind his head. Hi folks, welcome to the fifth episode of Playwright to Playwright. I'm your host, Rob Urbanati, the Director of New Play Development at Queen's Theatre. I've really been looking forward to talking to today's guest for weeks, and I'm thrilled that he's here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kui Gwen. Hi, Kui. Hey, how you doing, man? How you doing? I'm doing really good, actually. Not too bad. Where does this find you? I have no on earth, no idea on earth I, where you are. I am in, I'm currently in uh, Sherman Oaks, California, uh, Los Angeles, basically. I'm just uh, uh, in the valley. Where Is I that where you live now, officially? Yeah, I've been here about almost five years at this point. So it's uh, it's been a minute since I've been a New Yorker. I do definitely miss it, though. Do you come back to New York much? I did before uh, the pandemic. I try. Mm. I, I came back for a couple, you know, at least a couple times a year because uh, I, I still I'm still an active playwright. I still do shows. I, you know, I had a show at MTC that was supposed to come up uh, this past spring, uh, but obviously because of the world being what was, uh, it was postponed. And so hopefully, whenever you know we get everything back to normal. I'll be back again to to bring that up. Yeah, I'd like to talk about um, poor yellow rednecks and Viet Cong and um, that trilogy. But first, mm -hmm. I thought we'd go kind of way back if we could, because the first show of yours I ever saw, if I remember right, was on Eighth Avenue on a tiny mm -hmm. at a tiny theater where I had to walk upstairs. And <laughs> right. It was. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, I, we we did a lot of small shows, so like I can't remember yes. which specific one. This one was the trilogy, I think, Vampire Cowboy Trilogy. Vampire Cowboy Trilogy. Oh, that yeah. was literally our very first show as a company. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't know you. I didn't know you're that uh, that early, but you know, of a of an investor <laughs> in the world of Queen Gwen. But yeah, that was our very first show in the city. It was uh, put together um, uh, with basically a grant I got from a New Dramatist. It was a uh, the Van Leer. Uh, I used ha you know, as the story goes, I used half of that grant or the fellowship. To pay my rent for a couple months, so I could, uh, you know, just concentrate on on being an artist and uh, quit my waiting job, and also to basically pay for that production. Uh, to kind of go, look, I, 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 it's not all that often people give me money, uh, and so when they did, uh, to to kind of like do an early investment in me as an artist, I thought uh, the one thing I want to do is put a show on uh, to kind of, you know, put myself out there, and uh, that's kind of how it all started for me. I kind of flipped over that show. I think Tom Rowan from Ensemble Studio Theater recommended it because I was just starting at Queens Theater as director of new play development. And um, I went crazy for that show. Oh, and I wanted, I wanted to tell you something about it that, that's been with me for a long time. When I first moved to New York, one of the first things I saw was Charles Ludlum Ridiculous Theater Company. Oh, and yeah. Thought, yeah. And I thought, you know, wow, you know, I'm in this like great city where there's this great kind of experimental theater. And it reminded me of stuff I learned in grad school, like Jacques Coupeau and I forget the name, Théâtre de Colombie or something. I thought this is like being in Paris in the 1930s. And I remember thinking exactly that, not like specifically Paris in the 1930s, <laughs> right. but like I'm in this really special place where this amazing kind of 
theater that I'd never seen before, because I'd never seen anything quite like what you guys were doing with Vampire Cowboys. And it made me um, happy to be a New Yorker. And it stuck with me forever, that that comparison. Oh, wow. Um, that means that means a ton, man. That means that you don't understand how much that means to me, because like, uh, without a doubt, like, I, you know, I've been very lucky in my career so far. And uh, but, you know, when, when I look back uh, with that, uh, those early, early days of, you know, doing 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 shows before anyone knew who we were, uh, before you even knew anyone would want to see what you're doing. Um, uh, those are those are the ones that that just mean a ton to me. They're 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 instrumental in making me who I am. Can you talk about Vampire Cowboys a bit, sort of the notion of a company working with Robert Ross Parker and some of the same actors, some of whom you're still working with now? Yeah, I mean, Vampire Cowboys, uh, it was kind of, in, originally was invented in, in college with me and Robert in grad school. Uh, we, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you're young and you, you think you know everything. And we looked around what was being produced at the time. Uh, you know, he was a young director, I was a young writer. But, but all the shows that were on stage at the time were, you know, you know, the Seagull and Chekhov and uh, Ibsen and, and, and things like that. And I could you could tell that the students there uh, were in shows that didn't make them feel like I mean, it felt like they were they were they, they were doing these shows solely to go to get to be like better actors for them to do something, you know, a stepping stone towards what they actually want to do, which was like, you know, do movies and shows that felt like uh, more connected with them. And Robert and I were like, oh, that seems weird because I love theater and I think theater is so vital and, and could be so fun. I don't know why the shows on this stage make it feel like homework or, 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 or even worse, like a, like a history lesson to, to something that didn't feel you know, vital or important to the, to the audience or to the artist doing it. And so we just set, you know, set up to just create something that felt like the stuff we loved, which was like comic books and Hollywood movies, and 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 try to connect it with as much heart and passion and and inventiveness that we could could think of, and that's kind of like the beginnings of Vampire Cowboys, and and that was we did shows in college, uh, I think every semester we were there, and you know people loved it, um, it felt fresh and new, and then of course when we finally moved to New York, we thought we were going to put that stuff aside, that we were like, oh, we'll put that aside, and you know, we'll now concentrate on getting real jobs, Robert thought he would, you know, direct, quote unquote, like, real shows, um, doing classics and things mm -hmm. like that, occasionally dipping into doing new work, and I thought I would be writing um, much more serious dramas that dealt with, uh, you know, uh, the Asian American experience and things like that. Uh, and then at some point, uh, I, I, you know, as soon as I got a little bit of money, I was like, you know what, I, I kind of just want to make one of these shows because, you know, that first couple of years of struggling, I just wanted to tap back into the thing, something that gave me immense amount of joy. Uh, and that was the Vampire Cowboy stuff. And so we brought together, uh, you know, our artist friends that, that had graduated with us there. And then we auditioned some people to kind of, and, you know, uh, bring some fresh blood into it um and and lo and behold it just became the thing that uh stuck with us for years and years and years yeah fresh blood fresh blood indeed i remember that fresh blood being strewn across the stages <laughs> for, for many years um you you alluded to something um in terms of what you experienced at grad school with robert ross parker and actors being in shows that they didn't really want to be in but that they felt obligated to be in and or pressured by the professors into being in. There's, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you first, the plays that you first submitted to Queens Theater, which was this first autobiographical trilogy, starting with Trial by Water. Yep. Um, I know that you, I love those plays. I wanna tell you, I feel strongly about them. I found them very moving. Our audiences did too, mm -hmm. um, interestingly, because I think it, Trial by Water was the first play that we ever did that dealt with cannibalism. I'm trying not to work <laughs> it right. in, in the show itself, but I thought, what is our, you know, audience um, going to think of this? And they absolutely adored it. The, the connection between the parents and the kids was very moving mm -hmm. to them. Um, so uh, if you could, I'd like you to talk about that first trilogy and then how your thinking on that trilogy changed over the mm -hmm. years. Yeah, I mean, like the first, I mean, like, you know, when it comes down to, uh, you know, like being a writer, I've always had like, uh, basically three big major dreams. One was to tell, you know, my family story. Uh, second was, to, you know, just tell my own story. Uh, and three 
was to craft basically superheroes that um, look like me and my kids and, and my friends that aren't uh, that that aren't always depicted on in mainstream Hollywood, right? So those were the big three big dreams. And the dream number one was to tell my family story, and I wanted to start out with telling my uh, my aunt and uncles and my cousin's story. Um, and that was the trial by water uh, trilogy of plays, and you know the, they felt very important. Um, but uh, you know I wrote this in grad school, and you know you, you, when you write you write stuff in grad school, you get a lot of uh, you know advice and notes from you know professors um, on you know what is quote unquote uh, good you know playwriting and bad playwriting. And again, it's not like they 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 the critiques didn't weren't you know weren't legitimate. It was just I was so young in my writing that I had no voice yet. Um, you know, as I, I was, I wrote those plays when I was 21, 20, or maybe yeah, I was 21 or 22 when I wrote those plays. So I really didn't know anything. So all I was doing when writing the story that meant so much to me, I was imitating writers that I loved, uh, specifically like David Henry Wong. I was uh, basically writing like. Uh, like you know, to, to a point where I know I actually remember it. I, I, I tried to use the dialogue of Henry, David Henry Wong with the structure of Diana's son's uh, Stop Kiss. Um, and so it was very much like me trying to emulate writers I admired because I didn't trust myself yet. And, and the evolution that came later, um, you know, as, as probably people know, like I don't think too fondly of those plays, not because I don't think that the stories were, were weren't weren't important and good, but you know I, I felt like I made a lot of compromises to, and you know you know not not by anyone's fault, just my own. Uh, I made a lot of compromises to try to get the show you know seen and accepted and and produced that I know I wouldn't do now. And like basically after doing Vampire Cowboys for. 10 years or 10 plus years uh at a certain point I, I i found myself wanting to go back and telling to tell my family story but the only difference was at this point i actually did have a voice as a writer and um i wanted to use that voice to tell my story and it seemed incongruous to tell like a, a story about vietnamese refugees uh with the, the kind of style that Vampire Cowboys created with, you know, hip hop and martial arts and uh, genre changes. Um, but I, I thought that that's who I am as an artist. And if I'm going to tell the story, it has to be kind of um, done the way I, only I can do it. Uh, and so, you know, 10, 15 years after, you know, those first plays uh, that you read, uh, I, 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 I'm kind of back in it again and writing uh, you know, Vidgon, uh, uh, Poor Yellow Rednecks, and the third part of that trilogy actually retells Trial by Water, but now um, in in the style that that you know I, I've kind of established for myself as a playwright. Within, it's so fascinating, Quee, because I, I don't know any parallels of it in dramatic literature. Do you? Is there somebody who's ever sort of taken the same story and also? <laughs> trilogy of it and then sort of revamped the style and then retold that story again i mean it's just <laughs> the really only, yeah, unique to me yeah the only th comparison i could probably think of is uh is probably evil dead one and evil dead two by <laughs> by yes, sam raimi would. you know like sam raimi one he did it on a shoestring budget you know, it did well, he got some money, he got a chance to make another movie. And instead of making a new movie, he basically did Evil Dead again, but with more money, with more style, with more special effects. And Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2 are basically the same story, except for one uh, is a little bit more polished, right? And so, I mean, I, I've definitely heard of, of artists going back and, you know, uh, you know, getting second goes at, at ideas not very different from um el mariachi and Des uh i can't think of the second movie but uh but but you know robert rodriguez mm -hmm. did something very similar but um uh, uh but you know so so i so the only difference is going back to you know with my stuff i'm trying to establish a style with it with them it's just like oh i have more money to make it a little bit shinier here mm -hmm. i'm trying to you know I, I wanted to go back and uh, make it sound more like me. Yeah, I want to stay on that a little bit because I noticed even in the first trilogy that there was a kind of evolution and a little mm -hmm. bit of the vampire cowboy star was starting to creep in as we move toward 
I mean, from trial by water into the Latin America and then mm-hmm. lost accents. They, they're not all the same. They're not naturalistic in the same way. So it, I'm, I guess I'm asking, it wasn't sort of a conscientious decision. I'm going to sit down and now write these in a different way. It was just gradually um, evolving into something else. Am I? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at that point, it was... I was very much tiptoeing and slowly moving from, you know, play to play to slowly evolve. I was aware that I was trying to, to, to kind of keep my voice intact. And I was trying to bring in the humor and there's still a lot of that humor, even in trial by water, that first play with like uh, how the kids talk with each other. It feels incongruous to how you would probably, um, you know, imagine two refugee boys. Uh, but that, but that, that's kind of, you know, it's, it was my asymmetrical way of getting into the story. You probably would have, probably could have guessed how it could have been told. Um, and so, but, you know, it, again, like even uh, Lost Access, Accents, which eventually became uh, the Inexplicable Redemption of Agent G, which my company Vampire Cowboys produced in like 2008, uh, or 2010, um, like it, that was a slow evolution, but it was uh, it was very you know it was it was the same reason why uh, you know Lost Accents became Agent G was kind of the same impulse. Like my wife at the time, I was trying to write that last part, and it was for you guys, I remember, uh, and uh, I was having the hardest time writing it, and she was the very first person to go, "Why don't you just write it like you?" instead of trying to imitate uh, something you think it should sound. Because my thing was like, you know, Trial by Waters was my imitation of Diana Son and David Harry Wong. Part two was the imitation of part one. And I was trying to make part three do the same thing. But at that point I had done, I don't know, uh, four or five Vampire Cowboy shows in New York. And I was starting to have fun with it. And she was the one who kind of was pushed me into, you know, uh, to, to, you know, gambling on my own voice in the story that I, at that time, felt was, quote, unquote, too important to have it sound like me. Mm. Um, and so she's always, I mean, my wife is a, a very smart dramaturg and theater producer, in, you know, herself. And so, you know, I listened to that that, that advice probably a little angrily. I, I think it was a little, little bit of a dare because I sat down. I was like, well, if you want it to sound like that, well, I'll make you see how bad that's going to be. And I wrote it kind of uh, begrudgingly in the style of Vampire Cowboys. And it ended up being my favorite of that trilogy and probably one of my favorite Vampire Cowboy productions um, uh, as well. So it ended up being a very pivotal uh, piece in my career. Uh, but it, it, it kind of took... Uh, it took my wife to kind of uh, uh, push push me to be brave, you know. Yeah, I remember seeing that, and I remember talking to Abby because it was really tough to get tickets. It was like pandemonium. This was mm-hmm. the one at that theater near St. Mark's, right? That is, yeah, yeah. right. I, you know, I've been working for the census, and I walked by it knowing we were having this interview. I walked by that theater the other day and thought of you. And remembered going that night, Abby set up the tickets for me. And I remember that the hallway was completely oh, right. and it was really crowded. I love that play. Do you say now that Agent G is the first play? You've talked about your voice, the first play mm-hmm. that was fully in your own voice. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was the first time that uh, both like my voice as an artist, plus the content I always wanted to tell uh, outside of the superhero stuff slammed together. And like it obviously that that begat, you know, Van, uh, Vit Gone, Poor Yellow Rednecks, and it's kind of become the thing that, uh, outside of She Kills Monsters, are like the plays that people know me best for, uh, but it, none of it would have happened if it wasn't for that moment of writing uh, Lost Accents or Agent G, um, because it was that moment when I, something that I cared desperately about uh, matched up with a voice I was too scared to invest in, because I felt like, Honestly, I, I just thought no one would want to produce it. And it kind of took uh, my, basically my my separation from caring about people producing my work uh, that really allowed me to evolve. Because at, at that point, Vampire Cowboys was doing well enough that I suddenly was like, you know what? I don't really care if anybody produces my plays if I have my own company producing them. It had a strong following at the time. We Our budgets were still very modest, but it was still strong enough to, to you know, to put up decent looking shows and we had such a talented pool of actors. I was like, you know what? I'm good. I don't, I don't need to 
be produced in big regional theaters or big theaters in New York, as long as I have Vampire Cowboys. And that freedom to be able to not worry about that kind of acceptance anymore really allowed pretty a, a pretty fast evolution of my voice, starting with uh, Agent G. Yeah, Agent G, I love it. I think of it often, um, especially since we've been in touch again. Um, speaking of Evil Dead 1 and Evil Dead 2, and mm-hmm. your um, at least not desperate need to be produced at regional theaters, clearly that's happened. And right. so to see it gone, um, the, the high quality production standards um, right. was, was startling to me, I have to say at first, because the style of the play is so you know, familiar to me from the climbing up the flights of stairs on you. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So I'm wondering what that felt like to you when you started to see your work being performed at well-known regional theaters with big production budgets. Did it impact what you wrote at all? Or did it just, you know, feel good? Uh, it well, the, difference? Yeah, no, it felt, well, one, it felt phenomenal. But like when I wrote Vit Gone, like it was in the same impulse. Like, uh, you know, I was commissioned by South Coast Rep to to write a play for them uh they they uh and and at that point i decided i was going to like do this thing where i was going to tell my parents love story uh but i was going to do it my way and i kind of honestly if i'm going to be quite honest i i just thought i would sabotage uh my opportunities of ever being produced at south coast rep uh by just making it full-on vampire cowboys i was like you know what i don't know if they'll ever produce this i refuse to write uh, and what I, my, my, it was my own prejudice. I, I just assumed that they wanted plays that felt a certain way. And I was like, I'm never going to write it that way. Uh, me trying to chase that seems like fool's gold. I'm just going to write it and prep it for a Vampire Cowboys run. And so I wrote the most Vampire Cowboy-esque version of my parents' uh, love story possible. And, you know, as as everyone, as I've joked before, it was a sex comedy in a refugee camp that had hip hop in it. Uh, something that just didn't feel like a regional theater would want to produce. And so uh, so then, you know, it was really basically to my surprise that suddenly they wanted to produce it. And to suddenly see it on that big stage with that kind of like, you know, regional theater polish, I mean, that's, yes, that's cool. But I think what, what I wasn't taking into account, the thing that really kind of um, kind of blew me away more so than the production thing was the fact that because it was a major regional theater, um, you know, uh, Orange County has a huge uh, population of, uh, uh, of Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese Americans. And I didn't realize that they were gonna come see the show. And then for them to see a Vietnamese story on a stage that big with that kind of production value, uh, it meant so much to the community to see Asian American stories told on those big stages that it made me realize how important it was to have it there because like yeah i could have done it on my small vampire cowboys uh, stage in downtown new york but it wouldn't have had the same impact for my community um, as a vietnamese american artist uh that it had and so that was kind of really the thing that 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 kind of took my breath away more so than how polished the production looked. Um, it, those actors are still the same actors I would have used in a vampire cowboy show. The the tricks and techniques, uh, a lot of the artists that built the songs and the music and the the look of the show, the the puppets, they're all vampire cowboy artists. But to just have it on that bigger stage, to have uh, to, to have Vietnamese Americans uh, be celebrated in that manner and have Vietnamese American audiences see it, uh, that just meant the world. That's really fascinating um, regarding the audience and, re- you know, really a beautiful thing, I think. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, I saw it that um, Viet Gone at Manhattan Theater Club, where, if I remember, at least my experience was that that wasn't the case with the audience. And I was actually reminded of Queen's Theater audiences when I went to Manhattan Theater Club. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so what does it feel like to have that kind of sort of universal acceptance or at least wide acceptance with this? Um, strange, you know, odd, um, beautiful, funny, sexy, um, smart, hip play appealing uh, well, to those audiences at Man- Manhattan Theater Club that, you know, nothing against them, but they're nothing like any of the words <laughs> I just used. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, it, it obviously, 
uh, means of the world to have like a uh, kind of a universal response uh, for, for my play. I mean, uh, you know, like no, no artist <laughs> hates being loved or I don't at least. Uh, but I, I mean, like without a doubt, I think, uh, you know, like I, it was something that I was kind of wrestling with a little bit, you know, like when, you know, when, I, when my shows, you know, when I first started doing theater, when, you know, the majority of my theater career has been doing shows that are completely and totally accessible to uh, my audience uh, who tend to be, you know, 20 to 35 year olds who probably are still very much starting, you know, or are or, or in their early climb as professionals. So they can't really afford say, a lot of the tickets that the bigger theaters have. Um, and so th there was definitely that that moment when I looked out in some of those crowds, especially at say like a place like MTC where I knew the tickets were a bit more expensive and realizing that a lot of the audience that that usually go to my shows weren't there and I was I was struggling with that a little bit uh but I remember a piece of advice uh uh that, that another artist friend of mine Stephen Adler Gierges was giving to someone I just remember hearing it and it kind of really stuck to me uh and it was when he was like doing a you know his kind of big Broadway runs with his shows and he was like you know like yeah, you know, for right now in the immediate, it's it's really you know it, it really sucks that the audience that I usually write for doesn't get to see it. But the payoff is getting that kind of um, attention for that work means that it'll probably get pre published and then it'll be probably produced at colleges and community centers and small theaters and gives more opportunity to a lot of artists. Uh, to be able to play those roles than if I were to have just done a Vampire Cowboys and it probably would have never caught the legs that it does. And at this point, like, I know so many male actors, uh, uh, male Asian actors, who've had the opportunity to play now uh, the role of Quang in the show, uh, a, a, for all intents and purposes, a romantic comedy lead male role, uh, something they've never had the opportunity to do before, because often when those type of shows are made, they're not they're not casting Asian American men to do them. And for them to get that opportunity has just been kind of amazing to see. Like the lead on my show, uh, the, my productions, Ray Lee ended up you know, being a lead on an HBO series. I know he's uh, on one that's about to come out too. Uh, the lead in Robert Ross Parker's production, Simu, is the lead in a, a Marvel movie coming out, uh, Shang-Chi, his name's Simu Liu. And to just see, and then uh, other artists, uh, similarly, I've just watched their careers rise and, and, and do so well. Uh, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's hard to lead a show if you never get a chance to be a lead in any production ever. And to see these artists get a chance to be leads uh, in my show, to kind of just work those chops, to be able to like go, hey, I have the, strength and the, the 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 stamina to to carry a show from you know for beginning to end for two hours uh it's it's a different type of skill than just coming in for you know a scene or here and there and be funny uh and so it's, it's great to see that happen you know yeah that's really it's really remarkable to consider i think what you're saying you learned from the other audience uh, other artists of the ripple effects of these productions. Cause yeah, there's the MTC production in and of itself and it's polished as you say, and it has that audience, but then that's just the beginning of the journey for that play. And yeah. you've provided opportunities for so many people as a result of that play. I can't wait to see the rest of the trilogy. Um, and I guess I will have to wait to see. The rest <laughs> of the yeah, the, as, as the happen. case may be, it feels like uh, we're gonna be waiting a little bit. Well, we'll wait. We'll do stuff. Um, you mentioned uh, 20 to 30 year olds and college audiences. Um, tell me about She Kills Monsters. Why um, is it such this? Hold on one second. Yeah. Speaking of uh, 20 to 30 year olds and college audiences, She Kills Monsters. Everywhere I go, um, meaning to colleges, KC, ACTF festivals, when I tell people that I know the person who wrote, um, she kills monsters. They go crazy. It's their favorite play. Why? What do you think? What do you think it is about that play? It's been produced how many times now, Queen? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times it's been produced, but it's like hundreds, it's, uh, it's hundreds, right? yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's, it was like the seventh most produced uh, plays in high schools and colleges for two years running at this point. So it's it's a it's a fairly popular play. Yeah. Why is that? that? Uh, I don't know why. To be quite honest, <laughs> like I've written a lot of plays. The for for that one. 
to be the one that kind of hit and, and and become the thing that it is, I honestly, I don't know what made that experience in writing it. Cause like, I can tell you, like I wrote that play uh, in a night and it's, you know, because like the, the way the, it was the, the situation that came about with that was we were commissioned to create a play for uh, the flea over, um, you know, downtown New York um, with their company, the bats. And Robert, uh, you know, I know he's always wanted to do a devised piece of work. He's always wanted to do a devised play. And for the longest time, I'm like, well, I don't want to do a devised play because I'm a playwright. And if you do devised plays, I really don't have anything to do. And so, but at that point, I had, I was working on something else. I don't remember what that was at all, actually. But I was like, oh, I'm a little busy. So, hey, let's give it a try. You devise a play and I'll just come in and polish the words. And so he sat about for like a week and a half, quote unquote, devising a play uh and i came in i don't know uh, like that thursday or something and he, and he showed me what he had made and it was nothing it was just a whole bunch of funny characters and i was like this is not great <laughs> like it was a lot of a lot i mean not, not the the acting was superb but it wasn't like there was no story and he was like yeah uh, i'm showing this to you because on saturday uh the artistic director is going to be here and see what we have and this is what we have. And I was like, that's not great. And he's like, that's why I'm telling you now. Maybe you want to write something. And so I then went to the went back home and uh, sat about and I just kind of shuffled through my notes on things that I had written down. And I had written, I remember, uh, uh, on a piece of paper, like, you know, uh, it had the name of my childhood best friend who unfortunately passed away when I was 30, uh, when he was 30. And uh, the words D and D by it because that's what we did when we were kids. We played D and D, and so I was like, "Ah, oh, that's what I'll do." I'm, you know, this play that I've always meant to write for him, uh, in honor of him, I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm and and if and again because I had no time to think about it, I, the subject of the play ended up being what you know, like the intent of me writing the play became the subject of the play. It was like, oh, this is a love letter to a person who's passed away that I played D&D &D with. Well, the story of D&D &D is a love letter to, you know, in, in the only difference is about two girls to a person who they played D&D &D with that passed away. And so it became the same thing. Like I just put up the characters that we played with and just wrote it in a night. Uh, and I knew what I, I knew what the bad guy was. Uh, and, and, oh, the, actually I didn't know what the bad guy was because I didn't know, I didn't remember D&D &D that well because I hadn't played it since I was in like seventh or eighth grade. And so I shot out, uh, a, uh, a tweet to like you know the vampire guy with twitter followers and i was like hey i'm gonna write a dnd &D play if they're if i'm gonna write a dnd &D play what things should be in it and so they listed like different creatures and monsters and magic that should be in a dnd &D play and i was like great we're gonna use all that i'm gonna tell the story because i have at this point six hours to do it and then i just wrote it in real time which I never do as a playwright, but I wrote from page one all the way to page, I think at that point it was like, I made it to like page 76 or something. I just wrote it in one failed breath. And I brought it to Robert the next day. I was like, here it is, let's read it. And we read it and then we showed it to, to Jim Simpson the next day. He's like, that's great, you should produce it. And they gave us a slot to produce it. And that became She Kills Monsters. And I mean, there's obviously been rewrites since then, but that was the first kind of impulse, the, the first kind of like, uh rally that allowed me to write this thing and it's somewhere in there i think uh i think maybe what, what what touches everybody so much is maybe the heart of what that story is all about you know it, it, the subject matter of you know um you know uh you know it's, it's kind of that that dream the wish from the fulfillment of being able to get to know a friend that maybe a passed away that you don't get to ask stories from anymore and and so i think maybe that there, there's something about that but uh but you know it's just one of those plays that means a lot to me uh uh and i noticed like the plays that i write that that touch on something deep in me are the ones that tend to uh do better than say plays that i write that are just built on a curiosity um and so like bit gone and 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 that play in particular touches on something that that i feel you know that that that's in a deep well inside me you know it's really surprising, really interesting for me to hear because I've seen that play a few times. I kept bumping into it for a couple of years. I actually saw a production of it in a theater that had, I think, seven or 800 seats, one of these mm -hmm. gigantic um, college theaters. Yeah, exactly. And then I saw it at a different college at a, in a space, I guess the third space 
which had about 60 or 70 seats, and both productions worked perfectly. They were nothing alike, um, mm -hmm. but there, there's something really beautiful and profound, I think, about what you're saying that I didn't um, get from my experience of those plays that does, I think, um, maybe suggest why it's so incredibly popular. She <laughs> told monsters. Um, so I noticed on Samuel French that um, there's something called She Kills Monsters Virtual Realms, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Uh, I mean, that that was just uh, at the time, like when we dodged our pandemic, uh, it was, this was very early on. It was like maybe two weeks in. I started getting like a rush of emails from teachers from across the, the country asking me if it was okay for them to do like a virtual reading or a virtual production of She Kills Monsters. And I was like, oh, absolutely. You totally can. But then of course, you know, this follow-up emails were always like, well, can we change this to make it more, make more sense, blah, 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 because, you know, they can't suddenly fight each other in a virtual space. Uh, and I was like, oh, you know what? There has to be a way around it. And because I'm a playwright that loves to figure out challenges, I was like, you know what? Let me relook at the script and let me see if I can help build like uh you know the blueprint of a of a script for for more successful like um you know online production of it where the actors aren't going to be sharing the same space and uh so they could do things like fights so, and, and things like that and so that that was it I, I just sat down and i wrote that and once i started offering that I was like, you know what, maybe instead of having to wait for teachers to approach me about it, uh, for me to go, oh, I actually have a virtual uh, production version of it. I, I might as well just put it out there. And so I contacted Samuel French. I was like, hey, I, uh, I wrote this version of the script. Uh, should, should, should we make that, uh, you know, make it, make it something that, that, that anybody can do? And so they were very excited about it. And we threw it onto the website and, it, you know, it, it, it's doing very well. Uh, but, you know, I, the exciting part about that version, uh, which I didn't expect, was, oh, the, that, that the, the live stage production, that the, actually the one encumbrance to live stage production, is uh, to do that show, you actually have to be completely physically capable of doing it. Uh, in the vir virtual production, you can actually be physically challenged and be able to do the show because it requires now the fights now are that that happen uh the requirement there is the imagination of the audience and how clever you know you kind of put it together on this little screen that looks just like the one you're looking at me on and so it doesn't really require uh the same kind of physical um requirements that the you know the regular stage productions have so it kind of opened up uh, more opportunities for even more actors to be able to do the show that I think is quite fun and 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 you know uh, moving for you know uh, kids from you know anywhere from 13 to 25 to do you know. I totally love that you just jumped right in like you said two weeks into the pandemic and tried to figure out a way to you know create art in these times. These interviews, these playwright to playwright interviews, started obviously online content with the pandemic. And it's been interesting talking to different playwrights about whether they were sort of fearful about, you know, their future and what they were going to do, or whether, like Nina Key, who I talked to last time, had ideas instantly and sort of prefers virtual theater to um, live theater now. So I love the idea that you just instantly found something that you felt satisfied with. And uh, congratulations on the success of that. I'm dying to see it. Um, I'm going to ask you a very generic question, about, <laughs> okay. um, if, if that's okay, about um, television and screenwriting. Okay. What's, you know, the genericness of it would be, how is it different than playwriting? Um, what do you, what gives you pleasure out of doing writing for television and for film? Uh, I mean, like the, I mean, the, I, I love all three uh, mediums for different reasons. Uh, you know, like uh, obviously, I love the immediacy of theater. I love being in uh, the the house with the audience with theater. Uh, I like telling, in, you know, when you do a theater show, you're 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 experiencing a play, chron you know, basically in this chronological fashion from beginning to end with the audience, and that experience with the audience informs the production you, you do, right? Like if the audience is really kind of crappy, it affects what's happening on stage. Uh, mm -hmm. If they're incredible, suddenly it elevates a good play into becoming a great play. Uh, and I love that element about doing theater. Um, what I love about TV and film, which is different, um, because you don't have that, 
is, you know, often like what I like about, uh, uh, about TV is I love being in a room full of writers. You know, TV is done not in, in a vacuum. It's done with a team of writers. And uh, writers are, in a lot of ways, king of that medium, right? Like, uh, you know, you, you, you get to go on set. You know the show the best. Um, and so a lot of the questions are asked to you. It's, it, there's a lot of agency in TV writing that I enjoy. Uh, and it means a lot. Uh, and, and I like that kind of uh, making up stories in a group, uh, telling long form stories that last, you know, more than, you know, 90 minutes. Like, I really love that. Um, and then when it comes to film, which is still different, because that's more of a solo, solo endeavor. There's not like a writer's room when it comes to writing film. Um, I like the reach of film. You know, the, the one joy of it being 90 minutes or two hours uh, is you can kind of show it everywhere, right? You can show, you know, I'm, I'm writing a Disney film now. And the thing that blows me away is it's going to be translated in like 40 different languages. It'll be shown in China and Vietnam and and as well as America, you know, my mom and dad can see it in Arkansas at the same time I see it here in LA. It's just, it's that reach on that, that medium. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, they, they all, they all have different, you know, pluses and minuses, you know, theater, I feel like is my most immediate uh, uh, way of expressing myself. If I have an impulse right now, I could write something and uh, in a week later, I mean, it's not going to be the most, you know, the set's not going to be great or the costumes aren't going to be great, but I could theoretically do the show by this weekend, right? Um, but, you know, I, so it, the, that impulse is the, the, the time and uh, from that initial impulse uh, of what I want to make and me making it is very short. TV takes a little bit longer and film takes the longest out of those three. And so you're further away from that kind of uh, impulse that you have that brought you to making that piece of art in the first place. But yeah, I love all three of them. Uh, I, I, I don't, that, that, is that a good enough answer? It's a fantastic answer. And um, may you continue to flourish in all of these mediums. What interested you specifically about um, the Disney project, Ryan the Dragon? Uh, Ryan Last Dragon, that was, I, I, I was, I, at that time, uh, you know, like I was working on a different project uh, within the, you know, the greater Disney, uh, you know, uh, kind of ecosystem. And they, I, you know, because of that, I was aware that they were, this team was putting together uh, a, you know, a show that was going to celebrate Southeast Asian culture. Um, which, you know, my heritage is from, from you know, the, the area of, of Asia, which is like Vietnam and Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Laos, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, the Philippines. And so I, I desperately wanted to be part of that. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, I, if you're going to do that, I would really, really would love to be part of it. Uh, and then when the th opportunity kind of arose for them, they needed a, a writer to kind of come in to help uh, to, to co-write with Adele Lim, who wrote Crazy Rich Asians, on kind of crafting the, the thing. Um, like, like I, I jumped at that opportunity. I, it, it, uh, it, it was a chance to, to kind of fulfill basically probably one of, if not the biggest dreams I have as a writer, which is to introduce to the world um, a superhero that looks like me and my kids that's that that I kind of got to create uh, well, I mean when I say I got to create I'm obviously creating it alongside like an incredible team of directors and artists and designers and stuff but it, it, it it's it's taps into like the big dream and so I'm so so excited for people to see Ryan the Last Dragon and I hope uh, they love it as much as I love making it. Queen I'm so happy that you get these opportunities to do to I don't know, in a cliche way, to make your dreams come true, to do the projects that you want to um, work on, to create what you want to create. Um, you know, I feel like I, I knew you when, and one of the things that makes me the most happy in, over the years is when artists who I loved and respected early in their careers go, go on to achieve not just success, but, you know, artistic satisfaction in what they're doing. So I'm thrilled for you. I'm so oh, thank you, man. You. Thank you. And um, I, I want to tie it back to Queens Theater because, in this curious way, I always associate you with family. Because when I had these concerns about whether our audience would accept Trial by Water, and with the you know the content, the subject matter, um, 
when we had the talkbacks, they talked about the parents and the kids, the scenes. And remember, the parents aren't on the boat, but the right. scenes with the parents and the kids. And, you know, while we were doing this interview, and Jay may cut it out, somebody ran in. Can you um, can you talk about your family? I'm just interested in um, what's going on. I know you left New York. Oh, like my, my family family? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're yeah, really I right. mean, yeah, I mean, like, what's so, like, great about where I am now uh, is, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, I've kind of come to a point in my career where, you know, um, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is in honor of my kids and my wife and the family that I have, you know, like, I, you know, like, uh, when people ask me, like, why are, you know, like, you know, when you look at my resume and the plays I've written, I think people are often surprised that I'm writing uh, a Disney animated feature. Uh, and they're like, why? <laughs> you, you swear a lot. <laughs> you know, why would they, why would, why would you want to, why would you think that's a good place for you? And I was like, well, because I, at this moment in time, I want to write something desperately that my fam that I can watch with my family, that my wife and I and my kids can uh, cuddle up on a couch and watch and 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 have like a huge positive influence on them uh, with a character that looks like them. And so that's something that I was very excited about. And I, I suspect this is going to be the the I, I think you know I hear a lot of artists say this. I feel like this may be the trajectory, you know, like they're going to be a huge influence, at least for me, on the kind of work I'm going to be uh, running towards, right? The opportunities I'm going to be running towards, because I want to do stuff that uh, that that positively impacts them, uh, not just economically, because, you know, obviously these things are my jobs, but also just, you know, in that way that they get to see it and feel uh, seen and, you uh, you know, kind of influence in a positive way as they grow up and become uh, grown human beings, you know. Yeah. That's beautiful. There's a there's a, just a fascinating thread of family that runs through all your work. And that, that may be my perspective from how, you know, I got to know you, but um, it's interesting to me that your most recent project would, I don't want to say tie that together, but would somehow flesh that out in maybe a different way. So, I'm happy for you and the family. I'm yeah, happy for you and your career. I'm lucky. I feel genuinely lucky to be able to continue to see high quality productions of your work. So thank you so much for taking time out of your Absolutely. busy schedule. It's great to see you, Quay. Yeah, same here, man. Thank you so much, Rob. I miss you. When, when you come back to New York for Red, Yellow, Red, um, Yellow, Yellow, Red, 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 which is one of my all-time favorite titles. You think I'd get it right. Um, it's a fantastic yeah. title. Um, I'm going to look for you in the lobby and we'll, um, I'll buy you a drink. Oh, I would love that. I would love that, man. You take care. Have fun right. in California. Hi to the family. <laughs> Will do. So thanks, long. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Quee. And thanks all of you at home for watching this edition of Playwright to Playwright. Our next episode comes out on November 19th, where my guest will be Caridad Ceviche, winner of an Obie Award for Lifetime Achievement. Until then, you can keep up to date with all the latest Queen's Theatre at Home programs by visiting www.queenstheatre.org. This week, the New American Voices virtual reading series will launch its first fall reading, Poolside by T. Cat Ford. It's now playing on YouTube until October 17th, 2020. Thanks so much. Take care. Stay safe. Mm -hmm.